Well, good afternoon to you all. My name is Paulo Sotero. I am the director of the Brazil Institute uh, here at the Wilson Center on behalf of the Brazil Institute and the Environmental Change and Security Program uh, led by my dear friend and colleague Jeff Dabelko that is with us. I would like to welcome you and especially welcome the speakers and, 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 and discuss uh, the speaker and the discussions at this uh, very interesting and, in our view, important meeting. It was 20 years ago that the historic Earth Summit took place in Rio at a very different context for Brazil and for the world. Uh, well, Brazil uh, was called again to host this new conference on the United Nations Conference on Sustainable Development is scheduled for June of next year, uh, a meeting uh, that uh, will review the progress or lack of progress during these 20 years, two decades since 92, and also obviously the challenges in the coming 20 years. Uh, it is seen by Brazil as a unique opportunity to generate political support to tackle the current global crisis while taking into account the complexities of its economic, social, and environmental aspects. Uh, we are very pleased to welcome to the Wilson Center Ambassador Luiz Alberto Figueiredo Machado, uh, Ambassador Figueiredo is uh, the Brazil's, uh, Brazilian Foreign Ministry Undersecretary for Environment, Energy, Science and Technology. Uh, he has led Brazil's uh, in uh, very key important negotiations on climate change in the, recent, uh, the, in the recent past and he is the person in charge on behalf of Brazil to organize uh, the conference. We have with us uh, also to uh, offer comments uh, about Rio Plus 20, uh, Rishenda Van Leeuwen. She is a senior director of energy and climate at the United Nations Foundation. Uh, I am not going to read you the profiles because you have them but uh, the three people that joined us are highly qualified, very involved in the Rio Plus 20 process, and Brishenda is uh, one of them. The other one is <coughs> Jacob Scheer, Director of Global Strategy and Advocacy at the Natural Resources Defense Council, who was in Rio 20 years ago. Uh, and has remained involved and will be in Rio in, in June and involved in events leading to the conference's uh, preparation. Uh, last but not least, our own Thomas Lovejoy, a uh, member of the advisory board of the Brazil Institute and a partner in many ways also of the Environmental Change and Security Program, uh, who has been uh, leading a series here that we call Managing the Planet. And uh, we are happy to have been able to include this uh, conversation in that series. Uh, Tom Lovejoy is a, conserva a conservation biologist and professor at George Mason University. He's also the biodiversity chair at the Heinz Center for Science, Economics, and the Environment. Uh, this uh, discussion is being webcast live, and we are also on Twitter, so uh, people that, young people, and apparently older people that use that <laughs> technology, <laughs> is welcome. People are we uh, welcome to, to send uh, uh, questions and comments, because we are trying, we are going to try to present, to share uh, with, uh, to, with you and with the audience uh, uh, following these proceedings. With that, I would like to 
uh, invite uh, Ambassador uh, Figueiredo to start us off with a presentation about the Brazil's vision of Rio Plus 20 and uh, organization aspects of the conference. Uh, you prefer to speak from yes, right there? Yes, from oh, here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Paulo. Good afternoon. G good afternoon to my colleagues. Uh, in this case, an old friend. Um, an old friend from my country. Um, and um, I would uh, like to uh, thank uh, Paulo Sotero for this opportunity to talk about uh, Rio Plus 20, to, to uh, talk and listen also about uh, expectations around Rio Plus 20. I would like to start by uh, framing a little bit this conference because um, those who were in, in Rio, like some of us, uh, we, we know what a conference li like that is, but uh, m not all people have a clear uh, vision of uh, what uh, a conference like, like that should be. Rio Plus 20 is the fourth of a family of UN conferences. The first, of course, was Stockholm in 72, and then we had Rio in 92, we had Johannesburg, in 2002, and now we are going to have uh, Rio Plus 20 in 2012. Um, if you look at the, the thinking behind this family of uh, conferences and how this thinking evolved, uh, we, we will see that. Let me prevent that from happening with my own <laughs> uh, <laughs> cell phone. Um, uh, when, you, when, when you look at this, uh, this family of uh, conferences and how the, the thinking behind them, behind them evolved, you will see that Stockholm was much more focused on the environment. While uh, 20 years after that, Rio 92, uh, the the thinking was much more in how to balance uh, uh, e economic development, social development, and the protection of the environment. It seems it seems that uh, this vision that will stem from the the, the environmental concern and then go to um, the idea of s sustainable development that was adopted in Rio, it, it seems that uh, this vision is yet to be uh, fully applied 20 years after Rio. 20 years after Rio, we still see people thinking about the, the environment as if it, it is something apart people thinking about the economy as if it is something uh, apart from the environment or from the social aspects. And in, 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 in the social area, th the same happening. This uh, idea of a, a synergy, a balance uh, of development still, I think, it eludes us both in uh, theoretical, but especially in practical terms. And that's what Rio Plus 20 is about. Um, we are going to look into that. We are going to try, finally, to make an, another step in the, the direction of making uh, Rio the promise of Rio in 92 meaning that we are finally going to develop our countries with a balanced consideration of social, economic, and environmental aspects. Rio 92 was, for all pur purposes, a law-setting uh, conference. We had two big conventions, 
uh, and then a third one later, we had Agenda 21, we had the Rio Declaration, we had the, the, the Declaration on Fars. Uh, in some way, uh, it, it, it was a conference that set a number of uh, principles, a number of uh, legal um, path pathways for the international community. By the way, when, 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 when you look at the conventions, the, the, the so-called Rio conventions, you will see that they are truly sustainable development conventions. They are not environmental conventions. People still talk about them as if they are environmental conventions. They are not. They are sustainable development conventions. An environmental convention was what you had before Rio. Then you took care of the migration of birds, then you took care of uh, uh, certain aspects of uh, how to protect nature as such. Uh, if you look at the, the Climate Change Convention, it's a, a convention about how to develop without uh, damaging the, the environment and uh, pre preventing the development, the sustainable development of, uh, of people. So it's a different, uh, again, a different breed of uh, thinking. Uh, on Rio Plus 20, this idea uh, came to uh, the in international arena by a, a proposal taking th uh, uh, taken by pr President Lula to the UN General Assembly in 2007. And in 2009, the UN General Assembly adopted a, re a re resolution convening the conference. Convening the conference around two main issues. The first main issue is green economy in the context of sustainable development and eradication of poverty. That's the first issue. The second issue is institutional arrangements for sustainable development, meaning governance for sustainable development. Uh, and one specific vision that we have is that also that Rio plus 20 does not mean only 1992 plus 20, meaning is not only an updating, a looking at what happened in the last 20 years, but we see it mainly as Rio plus 20, it's 2012 plus 20. What are we going to do in the next 20 years? How are we going to uh, collectively develop, prosper, um, create jobs, grow in a sustainable way? We, we, uh, what, what we are doing now is not always working. And it's a good uh, occasion to look into this question, how to develop in a, in, in a more sustainable way and see if we can find uh, maybe um, new answers to this problem. So Rio Plus 20 as such is, is a conference ab ab about development, not about the environment only. Of course it's about, it's not any kind of development, it is sustainable development. It goes wi without saying, but it's good when, when we re re repeat it. Uh, and uh, what we are going to seek is, again, new ways of harmonizing the three elements of sustainable de de development. Moving to the issues that will be discussed in the conference. Green economy. Green e economy as as you know, the, the, there's no 
accepted international definition or common definition of the term. Um, but maybe we, we don't need a definition of this term. People often say uh, terrorism was never defined, although we know what terrorism is, uh, which uh, shows that not always you need to have an agreed definition about something uh, until you keep uh, um, uh, until you start doing something about it. So green economy is this kind of issues that you don't need a definition to work with. Um, and in, in that sense, it, it, it seems clear that we will not find one green economy as such, but probably uh, as many green economies as countries in the world, because each country will find its way of using that kind of toll, because we see green economy as a toll in order to uh, move in the direction of uh, sustainable development. As a tool, um, it should be viewed as a, as a group or as a body of practices that will make your economy more sustainable. And uh, as such, as a, as a body or is, as a group of uh, practices, uh, that's, that's why we, s we see it as not being one specific model, one size fits all green economy, but much more uh, each country finds its way. Some are concerned in the, c in the conversations that, that we have, some are concerned about what is called the transition to green economy. And uh, I, I personally disagree with the notion of a transition to green economy uh, as if green economy is a state. A green economy is not a state. Green economy is, again, a way of helping you to get sustainable development. So not being a state, you don't have a transition to that. It's a group of practices, it's a number of practices, and you apply those practices. Uh, others in this conversation uh, refer to costs associated with this transition to a green economy. Again, I, I, I disagree with that, with that idea. Um, I don't see that the evolution of an economy would imply costs, it imply investments. Uh, it implies uh, a, a movement. In a way, economies are always in a transitory um, uh, phase because they are always moving forward. And moving forward means investing. Moving forward, mean, moving forward means having costs associated with the choices that, 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 that are made. So I, I, I don't like to see costs there. I, I like to see investments and I like to see opportunities. Opportunities for uh, making things happen. So uh, in a nutshell, we see green economy as it will be seen in the conference as uh, an instrument to promote sustainable development uh, and eradicate poverty. Uh, the second big issue of the conference is governance. Um, if we talk about finally making sustainable development a, a true paradigm for development, 20 years after it should have been, anyway, uh, it is, it is it is natural, it is only natural that we take a look again at 
the institutions that we use, that states use, for promoting this notion in the, in the multilateral sphere. Um, going back to this family of uh, conferences in Stockholm, we had, well, we cre created UNEP then. Uh, in Rio, we created the Commission on Sustainable De Development. Um, in Johannesburg, we take a, a, a second look at the Commission at, at the CSD, and we improved it, trying to make it a better institution. In Rio Plus 20, we will look again at a system that is uh, probably not re responding uh, fully to the needs of uh, countries. Um, as the host country and uh, future president of the conference, uh, it is our duty to identify areas of uh, convergence and in this issue as in other issues. Uh, it is actually possible to uh, identify two broad areas of interest in this subject. One is what is called the strengthening of the environmental pillar of sustainable development. And the second aspect is pr promoting uh, coherence and sy sy synergies between the three pil pillars uh, at the same time giving political guidance to the working of the three pillars. The strengthening of uh, UNEP um, is something that, as I, as I said, we hear a lot about that, but actually views are very different on how to strengthen UNEP. At, uh, in one uh, point, you see ideas of creating a new United Nations organization that will deal with the environment. And uh, others think that this is, this is not the best possible way of dealing with this issue, but strengthening UNEP would be a good idea and uh, to look into the stability of funding for UNEP, to look into the qu question of uh, full membership and other uh, transformations that may lead to a more functional uh, UNEP. So you hear ideas basically in these uh, two fronts. On the question of promoting coherence in the system, um, actually what happens today is that the, the, the UN uh, Secretary General uh, is making a huge effort trying to uh, put more coherence uh, in the system. Uh, he cre created UN Water, in, uh, w which is uh, one way of uh, uh, congregating uh, uh, areas of the Secretariat that deal with water. He cre cre created UN Energy with the same uh, intention of, co of congregating areas of the Secretariat that deal with, with energy, and so on. So he's, he's, he's making a huge effort in this area. But actually, uh, uh, this is not enough, because uh, member states have the obligation to give coherence to the system and have an, an obligation to give political guidance to the system. So uh, that's, that's, the, that's the trend of this conversation. Uh, when people uh, um, look into and probe into uh, how to uh, make the three pillars of sustainable development to talk not, uh, not only among each other, but inside each pillar, which is not, it's not obvious 
and not evident. Uh, so uh, many ideas <coughs> uh, to make this happen are floating around. One is to one is the idea of cre creating some sort of sustainable development council um, based on the experience of the human rights area. Others think about uh, uh, looking into ECOSOC and seeing if uh, by uh, officially putting the, the environment aspect besides uh, the e e economic and social in ECOSOC, it would, uh, again, uh, play a role in uh, giving this political guidance that member states are t talking about. These are the main two uh, uh, aspects of this go governance question. Of course, you, you may ask, well, but then that th there is the, the internal g governance question. Um, hopefully, uh, countries will, will benefit from this discussion to take another look at how they are organized in this area of uh, sustainable de development. See wh what, is, what is moving on, see what is not moving on. Um, how the conference will work. And uh, the conference will uh, be on the 20th, 21st, and 22nd of June next year, talking about the high-level part of it. It will be pre preceded by the last session of the UN PREPCOM for the conference. That will happen on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of June. Of course, all this that I'm saying, spending the approval of that by the UN General <laughs> Assembly, but that's, that's uh, what we are proposing. So the last session of the PREPCOM will, will happen on the 13th, 14th, and 15th of uh, June. And in between these two parts, we have four days for devoted to activities uh, by civil society. The idea is to have uh, in these four days to have eight uh, events um, that we are calling um, sustainability dialogues or sustainable development dialogues um, that will cover uh, specific areas, areas that are not new but areas that are certainly emerging as uh, uh, areas that require a specific attention. I'm talking about uh, issues like energy, water, um, sustainable cities, in, in innovation, food security, things like that, that cer certainly would uh, uh, inspire uh, an interesting conversation in civil society. The idea is that we are going to invite um, individuals who have uh, deep knowledge about uh, the specific issue, like Nobel Prize winners, like scientists, CEOs of big companies, CEOs of NGOs, uh, media, uh, from all areas of civil society, uh, those who specific know uh, the issues and may have and may lead a conversation with a broader group of civil society. <laughs> uh, and uh, hopefully, uh, they will produce a s <coughs> some small set of recommendations by civil society about these issues. 
Um, the idea is that the recommendations should be or will be taken by two co-rapporteurs from each, uh, each dialogue. And they will be taken to the round tables of leaders. We are planning to have four round tables of leaders during the conference, during the, the three days of the conference. And so uh, basically two uh, of those eight issues will be, uh, will be presented to uh, each of the leaders round tables. Um, the idea behind that is to finally take the voice of civil society to uh, those who can take action. Um, is to create a bridge, a bridge between those who understand the issues, those who have a, a deep knowledge of the issues, and those who had the power, who have the power to. Uh, again, do something ab ab about it. Uh, we feel that the what we have now in the the regular UN conferences in terms of the participation of civil society and how civil so society is heard in those conferences is something that um, requires a an overhaul we we are not going to do this overhaul in this conference uh, but we are going as Brazil to cre create a new avenue a new e experience in uh, making it possible for the voice of uh, civil so society to, to be heard in a uh, better way. Um, we, uh, uh, I, 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 I would like to uh, specifically touch upon, I as con conclusion, to a to an idea that is around. It's not. It's not a Brazilian idea, but it's certainly something that we we uh, su support, which is the idea of uh, devising uh, sustainable development goals as a possible re result, one of the possible results of Rio Plus 20. As you know, the this this idea uh, has to do with the Millennium Development Goals that, as you know, will uh, that have uh, 2015 as the uh, end date. Uh, the Sustainable Development Goals sub would somehow embrace the MDGs. Uh, and uh, instill a certain sustainability viewpoint to all of them. And also the idea is that while the MDGs were some somehow uh, geared to developing countries, the SDGs, the S Sustainable Development Goals, would be uh, global in nature. Uh, would probably be up around what the world should do and not what uh, specific countries should do. Um, it's, uh, it's something much more um, of a vision of how we collectively have to develop in order to be s sustainable. Uh, the experience of the MDGs show clearly that uh, it is important to have a very clear message from the international com co community uh, to inform the behavior of 
the economic actors, not only uh, uh, the international financial institutions, but also them, of course, but uh, also the private sector. It is, it is really important, and that's, and that's where we see a, a huge added value there, uh, a clear message that we collectively, we should go to this direction. Um, it's, a, it's a focus, it is clarity, it is what the idea of green economy would be about. Green economy in order to do what? So it, is, it, it will be hopefully green economy in order to achieve certain goals and to uh, and this and this body of goals that will hopefully help us all in terms of moving forward in this path of sustainable development so that's what rio plus 20 is about and uh, thank you very much for this opportunity of talking about that thank you very much uh again for those following us on twitter it's real plus 20 prepare your questions also you here we i'd like uh, now to invite each of our discussants to talk for eight to ten minutes to react to what you just heard uh, and to contribute your ideas about uh, for real plus 20. uh should we start with uh, jacob Thank you so much, and thank you, Ambassador Machado, for that uh, wonderful exposition of, of the, the preparations and plans for the Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit. Um, I remember last spring I was talking to a group of foreign policy students here in Washington, D.C., and I posed a question to them. I said, uh, please name three events that are going to occur in Rio de Janeiro over the next five years that potentially could attract the attention <laughs> Uh, billions of people on the planet have a huge impact on folks and of course everybody immediately raised their hand and said oh yeah there's the world cup and then someone mentioned the olympics in 2016 and then it was sort of dead silence and i said well you know as important as those sporting events are the fact that the world's leadership is going to come together in june of 2012 to talk about the future of human beings on this planet may even be more important and one young fellow raised his hand and goes no mr Scher, i think the World Cup's more important. <laughs> in any event, uh, what I'd like to just take a few minutes to do is sort of reflect upon, uh, you know, sort of the, the kind of the changes that have kind of occurred uh, in the world in the last 20 years, uh, and to talk a little bit about, you know, sort of some of the expectations and, and whether or not we really can learn from the 40 years that we've been talking about that really the central challenge of, of, of human beings, which is how can we uh, maintain and improve the quality of lives of billions of people on this planet, but do it in a way in which we don't exhaust our resources or pollute it to a point that it can no longer meet our needs. And I've been, as, as Apollo indicated, I was in, in, in Rio. I was also very engaged in the Stockholm Conference uh, in 2002, very involved in the uh, Copenhagen meeting in 2009 and have been working for almost a year now on preparations uh, for, for the Rio Earth Summit. Uh, when I was in Rio, I remember in 1992, uh, I was at the Botanical Gardens with Bill Riley, who was the uh, uh, head of the U.S. delegation uh, before President uh, uh, Bush arrived. And I remember hearing a cell phone ring and I thought, oh my God, what is that? And uh, I had never seen a cell phone before. And we all started laughing when we realized he was getting a call from one of his aides who was about five feet away. But, but I thought, and I remember vividly, you know, thinking about the notion that somehow this call was going to some antenna and then up to a satellite and back down, and they were only five feet apart. Today, there are five billion cell phone contracts on the planet. There are about two billion people that are connected by the Internet. And the world has fundamentally changed. We're wired and connected in a way that just didn't exist. We've also hu seen huge changes in the numbers of people on the planet. We now up to, we just reached 7 billion at the end of October. Uh, that we added 1.2 billion people over the last 20 years. We've seen an increased movement of people in the urban areas. Uh, in 1992, there were 10 megacities of more than 10 million people. We now have 21 million. Uh, we've seen real changes in uh, the level of economic well-being around the planet. We've seen hundreds of millions of people come out of poverty. 
At the same time, it's becoming quite clear, much clearer than it was in 1992, that we truly are bumping up against planetary boundaries. In 1992, when we talked about dealing with climate change, it seemed like an abstraction. It seemed about something we were going to worry about for our grandchildren or great-grandchildren, and today it's here. And in spite of the fact that we entered into a legally binding treaty 20 years ago, which called upon nations to constrain their emissions of greenhouse gases, they have not constrained. And the real issue today is not whether or not we can stop global warming, but whether or not we contain it and adapt to it. We've also seen continued uh, pressures on the oceans. Uh, we have not come to grips with how we, we protect uh, and preserve fisheries. We've seen huge increases in the amount of, of trash in the oceans, of plastics. And we've now started to deal and, and recognize the problem of ocean acidification, which, which people didn't even recognize 20 years ago. What is another thing that's really, and I could go on, and many of you are familiar with this, and I would, I would recommend that you take a look at a report that came out at the beginning of November that UNEP did called Keeping Track of Our Changing Environment from Rio to Rio Plus 20. Another major difference today, other than the, the technology and the boundaries, is time. You know, we do not have 20 or 30 or 40 more years to figure this problem out. You know, we really have to get moving now. Uh, the International, Atomic, uh, International Energy Agency recently projected that we have about five or six more years to get ourselves on a low-carbon path. We will lock in a substantial amount of climate change. And I think if you look at a number of the indicators, while we are making progress in many areas, in many of the indicators, we really need to, to make this transition to a green economy within the context of sustainable development and poverty eradication very, very quickly. So what, do we, so what can we sort of expect out of this meeting? And I would, I'd like to sort of put out kind of a broader vision than, than the ambassador did, because I think while the meeting is extraordinarily important as a diplomatic exercise, I think it's, I think it's really bigger than that. It's, it's a gathering of presidents and prime ministers. Uh, I, I'm hopeful that we will have more presidents and prime ministers in Rio this time than we did in 92, or that we had in Copenhagen and Johannesburg. Uh, but it will also be a, ga a gathering of other leaders, CEOs, mayors, governors, heads of major foundations, and, uh, civil society organizations. And I think it's important that we do three things at this meeting. One is that we reaffirm the vision that we got from the first Rio summit of the ability to deal with all of these issues at once, of, of to move forward on e economics and dealing with, with, with poverty, of uh, being equitable and protecting and preserving the, the environment for future generations. And I think that's important because we have a whole new generation of young people who, weren't, who were not either alive or were very, very young and have no memory of the first Rio summit. There are 3.5 billion people on the planet that are less than 25 years old. And it's their future, and I, I like to say about this conference, it's not just, your summit is just not about the planet, it's about your future. So we need to reaffirm that overall vision. We also have to reaffirm and, and, and reinvigorate multiple pathways to getting to a more sustainable future. And I, I, I was impressed by what, when the ambassador said it's really important that we recognize that there isn't a single way of defining or getting to a greener economy. And it's a pathway that, that individual governments, many of whom adopted agenda, National Agenda 21s, our own country developed its own pathway. We really need to, they, we need to reaffirm those and get moving on those. But it's not only at the national level, it's also corporations. I was at a meeting recently where a representative of the Unilever Corporation made the point that every day Unilever sells something to two billion people on the planet. They have a big role to play in moving us to sustainability. So it's really important the corporate world be engaged. And it's really important that individual citizens take action in their own lives because ultimately they will be the drivers of the kind of change that we need to move us towards a sustainable future. And the final point is I think what this meeting really has to be about is really taking action and greater accountability. Uh, you know, we need, we've been talking about these issues for 40 years. What we really need is a meeting that the, that the, the, the Secretary General of the Conference, Saju Khan, just recently said is really a conference about implementation. And, what we, and we're really eager to see presidents and prime ministers and CEOs and governors and mayors and other civil society leaders come to Rio to talk about very, very concrete and specific things that they're going to do now and, and to really start moving us down the path towards a sustainable future. What I think is really critical, and I remember, you know, uh, in 1992, Rio de Janeiro for the first two weeks of June was the environmental capital of the world. It captured people's attention and imagination. 
we have to do that again. And, what we have, we ha and we have to convey to all the people on the planet two things. One is there is an urgency. The time for talk is over. We don't have time. We got it, you know, there are seven billion of us on a planet that's, that's, that's polluted and degraded, and we have to figure out a way to, to be able to manage it and improve it for the future. So there has to be a set of urgency, and there also has to come out of it a sense of hope. We have to recognize that already around the world, at, at national level, local level, corporations, people are doing really great and exciting things to make this transition. And what this meeting has to be about is bringing it up to scale as quickly as possible so that we do, in fact, uh, realize a dream of a sustainable future for all of us and for all our grandchildren and children. Thank you. Richenda. Thank you very much, and thank you very much, uh, Mr. Ambassador, for your remarks. And, and Jacob was clearly stealing my points because the two points I wrote about Rio were action and accountability. So if you take nothing away from this afternoon, um, from, from, from some of our comments, I would, I would hope that you remember action and accountability because I think those are both key um, in the context of, of the global agenda. I want to just specifically talk about one particular work stream that is going on and how that feeds into Rio to give you a sense of um, some of the possibilities and, and what is already ongoing. Um, I'm spending my time 24-7 um, more or less um, with an occasional five minutes to sleep, uh, working on a new initiative that the Secretary General launched recently called Sustainable Energy for All, um, which he announced uh, over um, in late September at the General Assembly, uh, uh, annual General Assembly meetings, and then uh, just a few days ago uh, on the 1st of November, also furthered an announcement of a new high-level group that he's brought together of distinguished um, primarily private sector corporate leaders and governments and civil society leaders, really to focus on a new vision for one of the themes that has already been mentioned by the ambassador that is going to be one that's, uh, that's uh, key in, in Rio, which is the energy theme. Sustainable Energy for All is looking at a global agenda, um, focusing on helping to really, as the Secretary General has, has said, bring about a clean energy revolution for the world. Um, there is one goal in mind, which is sustainable energy for all. So it, when we say for all, people have asked, well, who do you mean when you say for all? And he answered, well, I mean for all. Um, so one of, one of the aspects of that is really to focus on um, addressing energy poverty. And there are still 1.3 billion people, according to the, the most recent statistics from the International Energy Agency, that lack even basic access to um, electricity. Another 1 billion who have um, intermittent electricity. Almost uh, uh, between 2.5 and, and 3 billion who are using traditional cooking fuels and uh, unimproved um, fuels for, for cooking, which cause a range of health implications. So the Secretary General has come out with a bold new initiative that focuses on three objectives to achieve by 2030. The first one is um, universal access to modern energy services. The second one is a doubling in improvement in the rate of energy efficiency globally. And the third one is a doubling of the global amount of renewable energy in the global energy mix by 2030. Now, how does that relate to Rio? Well, the Secretary General has already indicated that his, for his second term, sustainability is the key for his whole agenda for his second term. So clearly, that, that already sets the tone um, for what we're looking to do in Rio. Within that, he has already said also that the sustainable energy theme is a core of his sustainability agenda. He recognizes, and we, those of us working in this sector all recognize that um, on the energy poverty side, in fact, uh, energy is essential to helping to meet the, meet the Millennium Development Goals or Sustainable Development Goals as they may become. Um, at the same time, it's a global agenda insofar as we're looking at improving energy efficiency, we're looking at doubling renewable energy. It's not an agenda for developing countries, it's the world's agenda. And he is going to be taking this um, through development of an action framework, which the, his high-level group is, is help, helping him um, bring together now and is going to be launched in Abu Dhabi in, uh, in January um, as part of the International Year of Sustainable Energy for All, which the 
UN General Assembly had, uh, had adopted and designated um, at the end of 2010, he's going to be using that as an opportunity to get commitments from the private sector, from governments, from civil society, from foundations, essentially from everybody that he can then bring to Rio and use Rio as a launch pad for action. The time is now for action. At the same time, he's going to be looking beyond Rio at this 2030 agenda. Obviously, if we can achieve this, um, as Jacob says, we don't have much time left in, in some senses. If we can achieve this agenda before 2030, um, that would be even better. But we're using Rio and the, the seminal opportunity that it represents as, as a mechanism to be able to bring these new commitments um, together, very high level commitments, very large commitments, to show that there is an opportunity for concrete action. Um, again, it's, it's not just about governments, it's not just about member states, but it's about corporations, it's about doing things differently. So we're very, very optimistic that we can use this time in Rio as a tremendous platform for launching this new way of doing business to really be able to take uh, us as a world in a different direction in addressing energy poverty, in addressing the needs of energy efficiency um, to be increased around the world, and also utilizing the platform that countries like Rio, who are the hosts of the conference, who have been tremendous leaders in terms of um, being able to showcase the, the value and the opportunities that uh, renewable energy in particular can provide for their own country's uh, energy mix to showcase that we can take this forward in a new way. And at the same time, um, to come back to, that's the action side, the accountability side, really also ensuring that we have a robust framework in place that we can measure and manage and ensure that there is delivery on the, the, the action agenda and on these commitments that are made because it's easy to, to come and make a pledging, you know, a pledge at a pledging conference, but really what we're looking about is a whole new way of doing business, a whole new action agenda. So we're very optimistic and very excited about the opportunity for Rio, but Rio not as an end really, but as a beginning and as an opportunity to be a springboard to, to get much further global action. Oh, thank you very much, Christian. Now we hear from Tom. So, uh, first of all, uh, this, this fits so perfectly in this monthly seminar series about managing the planet uh, that it didn't take more than 30 seconds for me to agree to bump the planned program in favor of this. Uh, <clears throat> because in, in the end, this is about managing the planet, and that means managing our own uh, behavior with respect to uh, the way the planet works. Uh, so, so Rio uh, was famous for three conventions, biodiversity, climate change, uh, and the one about land degradation. Uh, and if you look at where we are on the first two topics, uh, we have fallen behind, you know, in terms of red ink. Uh, the third global biodiversity outlook sort of lays out uh, that sort of uh, daunting uh, sort of situation. And, and we know that if we wanted to stop at two degrees, uh, which I can elaborate on sometime as to why it's too much for a lot of ecosystems, uh, we would have to peak in global emissions around 2016. So you might argue that uh, everything that happened 20 years ago uh, was an absolute failure. Well, of course it isn't, because an awful lot uh, has happened in the interim. Uh, it's just that it hasn't happened on a big enough scale or fast enough, uh, and that's what we go into Rio Plus 20 uh, having to address. So I, I want to say why I have uh, really uh, optimistic uh, hopes for what can be achieved uh, in Rio. Uh, <coughs> and, and I might say, you know, six months before Rio itself, there were a lot of doubts whether anything would actually come out of it either. So uh, 
just because everything isn't on the docket yet uh, doesn't necessarily mean we won't see a lot of action and improvement uh, in the months ahead. So <clears throat> what gives me a, a lot of reason for hope going into Rio Plus 20 uh, is there are a lot of very practical, uh, pragmatic efforts uh, involved. One of these, of course, is around the green economy, uh, which is about bringing as much of the value of, of, of the environment into the way we make decision making. Uh, we won't achieve a perfect formula right away. Uh, that's one of those processes that uh, gets better over time, but to just be st just straightforwardly addressing uh, the green economy is a very, very important uh, point. Uh, <clears throat> second, the issue of governance, uh, always a difficult topic, is nonetheless being you know, addressed up front, uh, right up front. Uh, the third uh, reason that gives me a lot of hope uh, is the notion of sustainable development goals. Uh, even though they haven't been formulated as yet. Uh, the Millennium Development Goals uh, were good in some ways. They were fairly weak on the environmental side. This is a chance to actually uh, uh, improve on that, uh, to, to really bring these elements uh, together. Uh, and they could include, you know, goals involving how you produce enough food to produce, uh, feed the coming additional billions, uh, how you do it in ways to protect the biological diversity, which in fact will be key to providing some of that food uh, through new discoveries in the life sciences, uh, and how you do it in ways that uh, are less damaging to the nitrogen cycle and to the carbon cycle. Uh, fourth reason for hope is the very uh, strong engagement of the corporate sector, uh, which of course when you start thinking about economies, they're bigger than most of the national economies of the world. So that kind of leadership uh, is very important. It does not, of course, include uh, those who fall outside of the formal economy. Uh, for them, the green economy is even more important, as TEEB has shown. Uh, but that, the kind of leadership we, we are seeing uh, uh, already developing on the corporate side, I, I find deeply encouraging. Uh, the, the fifth reason I find it very encouraging is going to be sound like I'm pandering to my favorite country, uh, but it in, in fact is that this meeting is being held in Brazil, uh, the leader in many ways of the group of 77, a country with a foot both in the uh, modern developed economy in a very major way, uh, but one which includes pockets of, of poverty, um, much as you also find that in the United States. But uh, Brazil has a very special leadership role. It's sort of right on the cusp between the old-fashioned industrialized economies uh, and the new economies of the future. So I really look forward to uh, Rio Plus 20 as uh, a very dynamic set of discussions and decisions, uh, and I'm really quite optimistic that it can move us, propel us forward more rapidly uh, towards sustainability. Well, thank you all for your comments, for the presentation. Uh, I would like now to invite questions from the audience here, and then we are going to go to the, this novel way we are going to do things here, remotely by Twitter. Fantastic. Yes, sir. De identify yourselves, please, uh, as you uh, be. I'm the chairman of the Millennium Institute, who is also going to be very involved in Rio Plus 20. 
We have developed a model over the past 15 years that integrates economic, social, environmental factors into a single framework and generates scenarios to help look and see what policies will lead to more sustainable development and what the positive and negative feedbacks are across sectors. We've applied the model in more than 40 countries around the world, from little ones like Swaziland or Jamaica to China or the United States. And we have worked very recently with UNEP on the Green Economy Report, where we use the model to demonstrate how properly selecting policies in the various sectors they were studying and integrating them in a reasonable manner could lead to more growth than business as usual and very significant uh, progress on environmental factors. We're also working with UNEP on the GEO plus five study, which is taking more account of the social factors. We've integrated many green economy factors into the model to look at the positive and negative benefits, and we take account of income distribution and social factors and things like that. So it's a very useful and powerful tool to help not come up with a perfect decision, obviously, but to compare different policies and stuff. We'd be very happy to meet and talk with any of you further about this or make an introduction to the model to see how it can be applied because it's a very useful tool to help bring people together because they can see how their areas of interest are taken account of in the larger framework. If you want to find out more about it, check our website www.millennium-institute.org or just Google Millennium Institute. It pops up right away. Thank you. Thank you for your contribution. Uh, Jeff and Sean, uh, would you have uh, uh, a question for us from? Sure, we have a few questions from those following the meeting on Twitter. Uh, Earth Charter asks, what will help governments at Rio Plus 20 make commitments towards sustainable development? Will only a reaffirmation of the vision be enough? Another one is, uh, how can Rio Plus 20 ensure private sector accountability in environmental governments? Also from Earth Charter. Summer Charlesworth asks, what are the chances at Rio 20 of moving beyond eco-efficiency and tech solution solutions towards integrating ethical aspects of sustainable development? Thank you. Uh, who would like to, uh, Ambassador, would you like to pick um, one of those? But I think other, other colleagues may. Well, first I would like to uh, refer to, to something that was said both by Richard and uh, Jacob and, uh, and Tom. Uh, uh, one, one very interesting feature of Rio Plus 20 is the private sector. We, uh, we see a, 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 a extremely strong uh, uh, interest and uh, and uh, an attempt to be of help, to participate, to engage, and that's fundamental. One of the things uh, uh, that is uh, that people don't realize is that a, a a a UN conference, as such, a a meeting of uh, governments cannot legislate for the pl for the private sector they they can only uh, 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 legislate for themselves so the engagement of the private sector is absolutely crucial and fundamental for making things happen and that's uh, uh, and that's uh, uh, and and that's why i agree absolutely with with jacob when he he said rio plus 20 is much more than one UN conference. It's it's uh, it's a platform uh, for uh, making things happen, and that's and 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 I would like to 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 answer the the question from the Twitter um, by saying that I mean it is not possible to legislate for uh, uh, the the private sector, but. Uh, to it, it is possible to make it possible uh, for the private sector to uh, engage and to cre create uh, partnerships, pacts, global uh, global understandings in in the private sector that will certainly be crucial for. Uh, 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 getting uh, what we want, wi which is sustainable development. 
Uh, yeah, uh, I just Jacob shared. I just like to add just a few thoughts to that. Uh, you know, I think in terms of you know what happens and what leaders do when they get to 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 Rio, I think it's really going to depend tremendously about what happens over the next 200 plus days, and not only in negotiations that will be going on in the United Nations, but in dialogues and discussions that that will be going on in in diff ne different various national governments and city halls within corporate boardrooms about the issue of sustainability and the real question will be will people be willing to come to Rio and ready to commit to doing something very very concrete and and, and significant uh, one of the really interesting features of of the Rio 1992 and of all these summit level gatherings is that each president or prime minister and and top government leader will have five minutes to give a speech and wouldn't it be really remarkable if each leader got up and said, you know, I recognize that, uh, you know, I'm responsible, my, initial, my responsibility is to my own people, but they represent X percentage of people on this planet, and therefore I am now talking, I'm going to commit today to a series of concrete measures that are really going to move my own country along in, in connection with other countries. And if you can imagine 192 statements like that, it would set a completely, totally different tone and would sort of signal to people that, in fact, we are really serious about doing something about the extraordinary challenges that we face, the ac ac economic equity and environmental challenges. And so I hope in, in some ways that, you know, people realize that what happens in Rio is going to be extraordinarily important, but what's going to be really important is what happens over the next 200 days to create the political will so we have a recommitment to sustainability and we have a, a real commitment to action and to creating new structures so we have real accountability. If I could just add to that, um, you know, I'm, I'm um, very interested in uh, the opportunity for the civil society engagement um, as outlined by the ambassador with the, the four days be between the PrepCom and the main conference and the sustainability dialogues. I think what he's outlined to you is for anybody from a civil society perspective is, is a tremendous opportunity to get those issues on the table, to begin to look at uh, those new mechanisms, get those new frameworks laid out, because those through those half-day sessions, in fact, you have the opportunity to bring those issues directly into the main body of the conference. So I think, I think uh, some of the issues that were raised are, are very valuable to consider. And, and as Jacob said, you know, the next 200 days is think about how best to work uh, with with uh, with the Brazilian government and others on utilizing those uh, civil society um, half day sessions, particularly on those different themes, to to get those issues raised. Uh, let me go here first. Uh. Thank you, thank you, uh, John Matuzak from the State Department. A question for actually a, a different question for each of our our speakers, real quickly, Jacob. Uh, you've set out an ambitious agenda. Um, how do you see actually the engagement in terms of the, within the United States and, and the connection with the uh, discussion, the, the obsession right now with the election that's coming up? I mean, how does this, your ambitions for Rio, how is it relevant to the discussion that's taking place in terms of the, the election and, and how that will go forward? Uh, uh, Richenda, I have a question. You said, well, what does for all mean, but what does sustainable energy mean? Uh, with the ambition of energy for all by 2030, <coughs> are your two sub, uh, sub ambitions in terms of efficiency and renewability, uh, if, e even with those, if you in fact make the investments to bring energy for, to all uh, with those kinds of, of sub commitments, are you going to push the planet beyond the two degrees that Tom talked about? Uh, uh, where ha have you done an analysis of if that's what you reached, what kind of, of investment would have to be made in coal and in other types of energy as well? So what does, does that actually mean there and, and, and what is it? Tom, you didn't talk at all about uh, ecosystem valuation, and I was wondering if you might talk a little bit about natural capital and, and ecosystem valuation. The thing is, we, people have talked about accountability, and the reality is, is that if you actually look to Agenda 21 and to the JPOI, most of the things that governments agreed to have been accomplished. You can go through and check all the boxes, and yet 
very few would argue that we are actually on a path to a sustainable society. So do we need to look at much more basic evaluations. I mean, we've certainly made progress in biodiversity, the number of protected areas and things like that, but we're still losing species at an unob unobtainable rate. And then finally, for you, Ambassador, why can't we actually change this conference? It seems the UN, you, you said you, we can't change the paradigm of the conference. We're kind of stuck with it. You're trying to provide an avenue for civil society input by having the four days and actually moving and having you know, a, the rapporteurs participate in the roundtables. But I would posit that is not the conference, the way we do UN conferences, not fit for purpose in this century. And we actually have to have a much more interactive conference, not where we just have two rapporteurs summarize those, uh, those talks which took place in advance, but that at the round tables we actually have CEOs and university presidents and heads of NGOs and mayors and the people that are taking action in those discussions. And then separately, is there a place to go to much, if, if we have to negotiate all of the agreements and outcomes, um, are we going to get a least common denominator? Are we going to get an unintelligible document? Because frankly, when I ask my family, when they, they, they know that I worked on the WSSD and they try to open it, the Johannesburg Plan of Implementation out, you know, they never get very far into it trying to read it. And for that matter, even Agenda 21. Can we actually get, if you're talking about concrete commitments, commitments that don't have to be negotiated amongst everybody? but that bring forward the commitments Jacob talked about from governments, but also the commitments that mayors and citizens and NGOs and businesses can. Is there a place in Rio for commitments which are not negotiated, but for people to put on the table that are accessible to your, your wife and my mother and, and my nieces in terms of actually, oh, this is what they're going to do, and actually be able to understand it as opposed to some of the things that we've gotten out of UN conferences. Well, thank, thank you very much. I'll just ask our uh, speakers to be concise in their answers because we have to go to a lot of people. I'll start off with an easy political question. Um, you know, I think thinking back to 92 and 2002, uh, and it, it's, it seems like these big mega conferences always seem to come at a, a kind of uh, uh, not the most ideal for, for American presidential politics. Uh, in, in, in and so uh, every president uh, uh, has had to wrestle uh, with whether or not to, to, to go to these meetings uh, and to think about uh, the domestic uh, political implications. You know, I think that, you know, I, I have a different perspective. I mean, I think that really I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking in terms of a perspective that goes beyond the next six, the next 200 days, the next three or four years, but really, you know, looking back 20, 40 years and looking ahead and sort of saying, you know, this meeting is extraordinarily important and it's absolutely totally critical that the United States is at that meeting and represented at the highest level and providing the kind of leadership that we need to, to move towards a sustainable future. Uh, and I've said to, to the White House that NRDC, along with other civil society groups, will do everything we can to make sure that President Obama is in Rio de Janeiro in June, representing, leading the United States there. And we will do everything we can, working with civil society counterparts and with the government of Brazil and other governments and the UN, to make sure it's going to be the kind of conference that he's going to want to go to. Okay, um, very quickly, yes, analysis has been done. If you address the 1.4 billion people with no access to electricity, even using today's conventional fuel mix, uh, total CO2 emissions globally would rise by 0.7 percent. So that is, that is a minimal amount and, in fact, can be more than offset by improvements in energy efficiency and by bringing more renewable energy into the grid as well. So. So uh, just on the energy front, uh, we are going to exceed the two degrees, which is already too much for ecosystems, uh, on the pathway that we're headed. But what nobody's addressing is how you can actually pull CO2 out of the atmosphere. And so ecosystem restoration at a planetary scale could actually pull 50 parts per million out of the atmosphere over a 50-year period. 
and we need to invest seriously in non-biological ways of pulling CO2 out and turning it into something inert. Uh, there's nothing in the physics of it uh, that's impossible. So that's the good news on that front. Uh, in terms of ecosystems, yes, indeed, it's built right into the green economy. Uh, and symbolically, Rio is the capital of discovery of ecosystem services. Because in the mid-19th century, when the watershed was really going to rack and ruin, the emperor declared the first tropical reforestation project, and it is today the largest urban forest in the world. It just wasn't looked at economically. Forest of Tijuca, for those that are not familiar with that. Come and visit. <laughs> well, well, John, uh, uh, well, first it's a pleasure having you here. We've been together in many negotiations, including Johannesburg. I, I share the same difficulties, family difficulties that you have in, <laughs> in explaining what I, what I do anyway. Um, I, I um, think that in, in terms of the participation of civil society, what we are going to do is an attempt, uh, an attempt to improve the, the system. We, we know that we will not find the perfect setting, but we will try a better setting for the, particip the p participation of civil society. And uh, I am absolutely sure that uh, we will find ways of providing spaces for the kind of uh, pacts you mentioned, the understandings among uh, uh, actors of civil society uh, companies and uh, other forces uh, from civil society, pacts that we have seen uh, really work. We, we have seen some in my country, I've seen some in other countries, and uh, they, they tend to work even better than uh, legislation. So um, we are very hopeful that, yes, this will be a feature, a big, f uh, a, a big feature of Rio Plus 20. Carolina. Carolina Costa from McClarty Global. Hi, good afternoon. Carolina Costa with McClarty Associates. Um, this has been a great panel um, and uh, very, uh, with a lot of uh, very, very interesting information. Going back to the private sector perspective, uh, I just have a question for uh, Richenda with regards to the Sustainable Energy for All uh, document that will be launched um, during the conference. How do you expect or is there an expectation for the private sector to be engaged with you all on the specific launch and with the specific document and moving forward? Thank you. Um, we hope very much between now and Rio we will be able to get a lot of uh, private sector. We, private sector is already very engaged, I should say, in the process. I mean, the, the co-chair of the Secretary General's high level group is Chad Holliday, the chairman of Bank of America. Um, there's a, a very distinguished group of, of uh, um, representatives from global corporations, among others, who are already part of that high-level group. So we've already started the, 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 the process of engagement. Um, it's not a document that is being launched in Rio by the Secretary General. It's the initiative is already ongoing. It's really going to be that he's going to be showcasing some of these commitments, um, not only to show to show what what has been put in place, but really to showcase what more we need to do, and again to put the emphasis on action. So we're hoping that there will be commitments that we can showcase in Rio, and that Rio will also act as an opportunity, as a catalyst for developing more of these commitments over time as well. Sean, you have one there. We have two more questions, one from UN Insider, who asks, how can CSOs actually be included in Rio Plus 20 if there is no overhaul? And the other is the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health. Uh, our council believes that family planning is a concrete, cost-effective intervention in sustainable, mm -hmm. sustainable development. Do you agree? Who would like to have an <laughs> easy question? Because we're off the ambassador. No. <laughs> <laughs> Reproductive health. Any takers? Yes. <laughs> 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 
So one question was about CSOs, Chief Sustainability Officers. Civil Society Organizations. Society organizations. Okay. Civil Society Organizations. Well, we've, we've been talking about that. I mean, we've been already talking quite a bit yeah, about I the role so. of civil society I organizations. So. Okay. Any, any, you know, any approach on, on, on gender issues, uh, reproductive? Because no. I didn't get the, 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 the question. Actually. Could you repeat the second question, uh, Sean, please? So this is, again, from the Global Leaders Council for Reproductive Health. And they ask, our council believes family planning is a concrete cost-effective intervention in sustainable, sustainable development. And I guess they just want to know if you agree. Well, many... If there's a place in the Rio agenda for... Well, many, many, many people uh, talk about uh, uh, issues linked with uh, um, population, including, of course, uh, uh, reproductive health and other, and other issues. Uh, they are cross-cutting issues, actually. They, they are not uh, specific issues for a specific uh, theme. They will be seen, certainly, and will be discussed, certainly, by civil so society and by, govern and by governments. But, but I, I, m my guess is that the debate in civil society will even be richer. Hi, I'm Dan Jacobs from the American University School of Business, where I direct its, it, its MS in Sustainability Management Program. Now I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> Ambassador, um, I'm, I'm very happy to hear you say that you will be reaching out to the private sector, because I think, uh, having been myself at the original Rio in 92, um, that big business really didn't play the role that it should have. And I think it's time for big business to step up to the plate, as we say in this country. Um, I wonder what can be done in the next 200 days to sort of bring big business more into the picture as we approach a Rio Plus 20. Should the Secretary General be reaching out to the CEOs? Um, what, what do we need to do now to make sure that big business does play a major role at Rio Plus 20. Thank you. I'd like to compliment that, uh, Ambassador. I would like to compliment that. I, I cover Rio 92 as a journalist. At that time, uh, we didn't think much about Brazilian multinational companies. Now they exist, uh, and they work in areas, obviously, that impact the environment. What is, for instance, uh, from the Brazilian, perspective, Brazilian government perspective, is there uh, their plan to engage big companies starting with the ones from Brazil? Well, uh, big business, but not only big business, business as such, be it small or, or, or big, uh, uh, is already uh, very much engaged in the UN system. We have the Global Compact. Uh, the, there are many, many associations uh, that usually take part in this uh, kind of uh, conferences, there are there are meeting and uh, with parallel processes in preparation for Rio Plus Twenty. So, I see a a very strong engagement of the business, uh, the the business sector, be it small or big, and certainly in my country, that's amazing. It is amazing how the business sector is embracing this conference and uh, uh, definitely want to play a very clear role. In the back there, please, sir. My name is Clive Mutunga from uh, Population Action International. Given the events that are happening in uh, climate change, especially uh, in international climate finance, uh, what's your take on what is going to happen in Rio in line with uh, the two important concepts that you mentioned on accountability and action in terms of uh, mobilizing funding to, uh, to fund the path towards a sustainable future. Are we looking at uh, maybe coming up with a new green climate fund for sustainable development? Thank you. This question is uh, open to any of uh, the panelists. Thank you. Would like to take it. 
Well, uh, as uh, well now as uh, uh, playing the role of uh, the host country and the future pr president of of the conference, certainly this is th this this issue is one of the issues that uh, countries refer to uh, very uh, very often. Um, we don't have yet a clear picture on how this conversation is going to um, be converted into action in this area in Rio. Uh, what we see uh, at this point is time, in time is a lot of interest uh, for, this, for this area since Rio Pl Plus 20 is a conference that will make things happen, hopefully. But making things happen is not only in the area of governments. Governments making it happen is the whole society making it happen. So certainly funding, certainly means of implementation is a crucial issues, issue for both for governments as for uh, a civil so society. Uh, we don't have at this point in time a clear uh, view of how the conversation is going to uh, lead to the outcome in, in Rio. But, of course, we will have uh, 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 a product from Rio that will have to do much more with making it happen than to uh, crea creating new organizations in this area or new funds or new... I, I, I frankly don't see uh, a, a, a cre creation of an institution in Rio to deal with this issue. I was just, you know, I think the, the question of, of how climate will be discussed in Rio, I think, will be the subject of much greater attention after, after Durban. Uh, and 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 you have a separate form and structure uh, for thinking at, and addressing the climate finance issue. And I think you know there will be once that meeting is over at the end of December. I think all this, the, there will be people discussing within governments and civil society how to take those questions to 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 Rio because uh, the, they'll still be on the table. I think what we've what we've been looking at is trying to focus the discussion on climate and energy in Rio in a way and where we really focus less on uh, funding, timetables and targets, but more on, on real deliverables uh, in significant new investments in sustainable energy for all and energy efficiency and stimulating the elimination of ineff inefficient incandescent light bulbs uh, and, and looking and really stimulating uh, much greater efforts to reforest the world and really focus on you know, a set of really concrete measures that uh, uh, networks of, of governments, uh, international agencies, uh, uh, and other stakeholders could undertake to actually move us forward uh, towards uh, reduced emissions and greater resilience. If, if, uh, if I may uh, uh, com com complement what you said, on, on climate change, people often ask me, well, wh what is Rio going to do about the negotiations on on cl climate change after Durban, I always say we we are going to do nothing about the negotiation of climate change. Hopefully, we will do something about solving the problem yeah. of climate change. So we we are not going to to capture the negotiation and try to solve that. No, that's another problem that has a specific forum. What we are going to do, hopefully, is to take action that will help. Uh, solving the problem of climate change. Yes, uh, I have a question in the back there. Yeah, uh, Bill Ferguson, uh, Grinnell College Economics and Policy Studies. Um, I've heard a fair amount of a mention of commitments that might come out of the Rio Plus 20. Uh, so I'd like to ask, what do you think are feasible commitments that could emerge from the meeting? And secondly, what mechanism would be in place to make these commitments credible in the sense that we actually expect the parties that issue the commitments to live up to them in the future, given that those commitments are likely to be quite costly? Who would like to volunteer an answer? 
Well, in part, I would count on civil society. If it's, <laughs> yeah, I, <laughs> Um, if I can speak specifically to the work that we're doing on the energy side, then um, built into the Secretary General's initiative on sustainable energy for all is going to be very much a robust um, accountability framework. Now, I mean, we're still we're still um, in the process of of, uh, of developing what you know what a key commitment can look like, but I think um, uh, you know that there's going to be. Uh, larger and smaller commitments and in fact we we almost sort of have our first commitment already for somebody had mentioned um, um, our children's generation well Lincoln Park uh, who some of you may know uh, last year last week I should say in New York made a commitment already um, to support uh, a power the world initiative um, which is really supporting the uh, Secretary General's initiative in the run-up to Rio and um, we're even hoping that that perhaps they could come down to Rio and, and, and have a role to play there. But they have 36 million fans on Facebook. And, uh, you know, we're looking at, at, at commitments from different entities and um, are, are very much working on the best mechanism to to look at how we can uh, hold those commitments uh, accountable. And, and as somebody's already said, I think civil society um, yeah. generally plays that role. So. Uh, um, I see very much uh, that aspect being taken care of in part there. Hi, I'm Christina Beasley, representing the elusive, less than 25 years old uh, demographic mm. from uh, <laughs> George Washington University. And I, Richenda just referred to this a little bit, but I was curious as to uh, the involvement that was being attempted to uh, to be in place for the conference in terms of a youth voice and youth initiatives, uh, whether or not there was going to be a youth delegation in attendance, and how you were planning on reaching out to kind of that demographic and making it apparent the severity of the issues and uh, how mm -hmm. on a smaller level, um, mm -hmm. e even just within universities, within uh, communities, it, change might be able to be instigated and kind of be built into uh, educational systems. and. Yeah, anything, and anyone can answer. Well, part of it, uh, uh, of course, uh, the youth is one of the uh, nine major groups that the UN uh, had identified as as key parts of civil society. So uh, we hope that uh, young people will have a strong p participation. We uh, have had in the past also in other conferences like climate change and other conferences a strong participation, including in national delegations. And hopefully we will have this again, certainly in the, in the case of my country, we will have that. Uh, and uh, uh, I would like to yield to uh, one yeah. of the colleagues. Yeah, I, I, I would just add that I, there you know, there are, uh, I think there's been a real effort to try and really engage uh, youth. Uh, there was, a, UNEP organized a, a, a youth conference uh, in Indonesia earlier this fall uh, to really uh, take a look at uh, the, uh, the, the upcoming uh, Rio Plus 20 Earth Summit and, and they've developed a declaration. Right now in, in New York City, there's a group called Peace Child International that's been involved. And in fact, I think they actually they're going to have a demonstration today and they're going to invite Mayor Bloomberg to come uh, to, to Rio. Uh, I hope we welcome. Uh, but so there are, there are a lot of civil society organizations. And I think in some ways, you know, it's really <coughs> one of the challenges we have today, I think, is that we see young people are extraordinarily connected. Uh, and you say, what are you connected to? And they go, I'm connected to social media. All right, well, what are you connected to beyond that? And can we get young people connected to, in a sense, the rest of humanity and to the planet and for them to recognize that, you know, I know they're worried about, as they should be, their own futures, their own jobs, their own prospects, but to recognize that this is a challenge that they share with young people all over the world and that they have to put pressure on their parents uh, to, who are now leading this world to really make sure that they, too, are going to have a bright and prosperous future. And so, you know, and I think the point you made, you know, it, I think that, you know, what we have to get people to understand is that we, we can have this one broad vision of sustainable development. We can have a lot of different pathways to get there, but it's going to take millions of actions, and people have to look at how they can go from being less sustainable to more sustainable in their own sphere. And I think, you know, it would be great to see the universities of the world 
do even more than they're doing to show how it's possible to be green and, and, and economic and equitable at the same time as well. If, if I could just add one point as well, um, sort of a broader point than, than Rio per se, but um, I work with a lot of social enterprises and many of them, if not most of them, are founded by people certainly under the age of 30, many of them um, straight out from college. Some of them are non-profit, some of them are for-profit. I think we see so many opportunities now for that kind of engagement and certainly I would say young people are already leading the way on many of the more sustainable approaches um, for both private sector and non-profit. So I think there's a lot more that can be done, but you're already doing it. So, you know, I think being at Rio is, is one aspect, but it's also looking at even if you're not going to be there in person, what can you be doing in your local community and how can you engage locally? Let me ad address that point. One uh, huge difference, again, as Jacob said, from 92 to 2012 is that, well, I, my first cell phone was during the conference <laughs> as a member of the Brazilian delegation. We all had cell phones. It was a shoebox. Anyway, <laughs> uh, uh, right. but, but it worked. <laughs> and um, uh, what we are going to have now is uh, we are going to try to use extensively the new media. Mm. And uh, even if people cannot go to Rio, they will participate as we are having here the new ideas about using Twitter, using other other media. That's that's right. that's something that we are going to do also. Yeah, the, on that within uh, Ambassador uh, Figueiredo Machado mentioned the youth uh, that youth is one of the f uh, nine major groups. The organization is a group there there is a international group that does that and the US uh, liaison really to that group has been an organization called sustain us or sustain us mm -hmm. and they have engaged very very broadly with the youth from around the world including to try and and engineer a a social media way in which youth from around the world who cannot go to Rio can in fact participate in it. But I would encourage you to contact them. They have been active in the Commission mm -hmm. on Sustainable Development as the U.S. vehicle to participate in the broader youth major group. Okay, uh, thank, same place. thank you. Questions? I, oh yeah, there is one there. Hi, my name is Pana. Um, I work at EPA. I think it's wonderful that there are so many opportunities for participation in Rio Plus 20 and that there will be such a strong private sector presence. Um, but given that the, at the end of the day, private sector is mostly focused on its product and may not be promoting its CSR practices um, to the degree that they can change minds, I wonder what is your outreach strategy for engaging people who not only won't be at Rio, but aren't paying attention to it and may, as Mr. Scher said, think that the World Cup really is the most important event taking place in Rio. Well, we're Paul Arvison with uh, Solar Household Energy. Uh, we uh, do solar cooking projects around the world, and I'm interested in the question about microfinance and micro business, since it looks like the profit motive is the only way we're going to really scale up to a large scale for any kind of uh, development down at the uh, village <coughs> level, at the small household level. Uh, what do you see are the prospects for microfinance and uh, micro business development going forward? May I ad address the f first question then? Uh, uh, which, uh, which was, I'm sorry, about the outreach, the outreach strategy. I am sorry. And I'm not a candidate. <laughs> and, uh, um, <laughs> and, uh, I, I would, uh, like to, uh, to, uh, say that first we, we have a strategy for uh, uh, outreaching, uh, especially in Brazil, 
but also ab abroad. We uh, we have um, 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 partners in um, different uh, areas of the media, and uh, and uh, who are very interested in this uh, this this conference and and how they can help mobilizing people. So we are so we are doing that uh, uh, with them. We we have a strategy also of a conversation with media abroad, uh, trying to make sure that uh, uh, people understand what this conference is about and what are the opportunities for action that we will have in, in uh, uh, Rio. So uh, that's, that's part of it. But of course, it's not only one country that, that, that can do that. Uh, hopefully this will uh, be reproduced uh, and will re re reverberate in uh, uh, other areas. Oh, on the question of microfinancing and op opportunities for financing, one of the, the conversations that we would like to have, and specifically uh, we will pr provide a specific setting for civil society to discuss that, is the, the question of the economics for sustainable development. Our feeling is that um, so, so far many, uh, many e economists have written about that, but you, but you don't see a clear um, line in, in, in e e economics that, that you may identify, no, no, this is sustainable development economics. Our hope is that we uh, pr provide a space and op opportunity for this conversation to happen. And certainly, uh, financing uh, and uh, microfinancing and, and, uh, and, and uh, all kinds of uh, e economic options will be on the table and hopefully we will uh, get uh, from Rio a, a, a clearer picture of w what is needed in that area. Yeah, I just, this, to the first questioner's point about sort of the sort of relative lack of, of uh, awareness of, of, the, of Rio uh, at this point. Or, now, when I was talking about my presentation that was six months ago, and I, I, I've seen recently some really encouraging signs that, that people are around the world starting to really engage in this meeting. Um, November 1st was the deadline for the submission of views uh, to the UN uh, Rio Plus 20 Secretariat. And they received about over 600, including about 500 uh, uh, submissions from non-governmental civil society organizations all over the world. So it, it indicates a lot of and growing uh, engagement. And then just yesterday, there was so much traffic at the, uh, the website, UNCSD 2012, that actually shut down. It got overwhelmed. And I, I, I really believe that after Durban, after the beginning of the year, people will start focusing on the fact that indeed the leadership of the world is coming to Rio. It's the beginning of this threesome of extraordinarily important events and that we will see people really recognizing that that you know that this is the place that we have to come and really act and really put ourselves in a path towards a sustainable future so i'm really hopeful that it will yeah. that we will see that change very quickly i would like to invite uh, each of the participants uh, in reverse order and, and the <coughs> ambassador to offer any final comments uh, that I'll start with me. So I actually want to make uh, an institutional comment. Uh, uh, many of you are new to the Managing the Planet series. Uh, and I just want you to know that the next one on December 14th will be about the role of national governments. Uh, and it will be led by Martha Johnson, the head of the, the General Services Administration. It's going to be a lively one. My hope um, looking forward is that 20 years from now, I just, uh, um, I'm a step grandmother of, of five little boys, and so I'm sort of thinking about their future. And, and 20 years from now, I want to be able to turn to them and say, you know, 
Um, this is where, at Rio plus 20, this is where the world decided to do things differently and better. And I hope 20 years from now that, that we'll be able to sort of look back and say, okay, this is where we really committed to change. Uh, and I would just like to add that, you know, that I, I, I'm very, very hopeful about the prospects for Rio. And I, I just, a few weeks ago, we were at the United Nations with Occam Steiner, the head of the United Nations Environment Program, and we were celebrating the removal of lead finally from the world's gasoline supply, which was a process that began with a lawsuit uh, brought in, in the United States in the early 70s, but a process that was interesting. When we went to Rio, it turned out that Brazil was actually ahead of the United States and many other countries in having already phased out lead in gasoline, but that the Earth Summit provided a real impetus which then has now finally gotten this toxic material out of lead and gasoline. It took 40 years. It shows that we can actually do things, but once again, what we have to do is figure out how to do things a lot faster. And I think that, you know, we have this opportunity with the technology. Uh, the State Department is going to be sponsoring a conference on information technologies and the role in sustainable development in the early February, which I think is going to be really, really important. And I think that we have a lot of tools and ability now to get ideas out there much more effectively and also, I think, to create uh, a sense of urgency and action uh, throughout, uh, throughout society and can bring about the kind of world that uh, we all want to live to, to your grandchildren as well as to my own. I, I would like to use this opportunity for thanking uh, Paulo for... Uh, inviting me here and giving me this opportunity. I, I would like to say that society is absolutely crucial to make things happen. Civil society is uh, the, the key. Let me give you one example. Those that were in Rio, like uh, some of us, we adopted in 92 a convention on cl climate change who said, which said, inequivocally that uh, cl climate change was a f phenomenon caused by man and that countries should act to together in controlling that. Uh, and the fact is that it, it took almost 20 years, but it took 17 years for society to be fully informed or of that and to put pressure on governments as it did uh, before Copenhagen. And, and it was only then, it was only because of this pressure of society that, that countries entered in a new phase of the, of the negotiations. Um, the fact is, it took us 17 years from Rio 92 to Copenhagen 2009. Certain issues take a long time if society is not engaged. If society is engaged, things happen much faster. And that's why we put our faith in the participation and the engagement of civil society in Rio Plus 20 so that we all can make things happen. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Before I thank you uh, all, I would to, uh, to, to just mention Jacob, that student that answered your question about the big events coming, about the one in 2014, he's absolutely right. So <laughs> <laughs> because this is tremendously important, but for people from my age group, it will be real plus 64. <laughs> Those of you had, that know what happened in, in Brazil in 1950 in the Maracanã Stadium, uh, it, that was the first time actually I think that Brazil held a, a global yes. sort of event. Uh, it didn't, well, we're not ready actually, but, <laughs> okay. but now we are to hold Rio plus 20 and then Rio plus 64, uh, and, uh, which will be around June, July uh, 2014. Uh, uh, I wanted also to call your attention to uh, two events here, two discussions, one on the 21st of November. If you, are in, if you uh, have interest in knowing about uncontacted indigenous peoples in Brazil, uh, we'll have a session 
Uh, it's a book launch by a former Wilson Center scholar, Scott Wallace. He's a photographer and a writer from the National Geographic. He went into an expedition in the Amazon with uh, uh, Brazilian officials that are responsible for preventing contact uh, with indigenous uh, people in Brazil that do not want contact. They want to live in isolation. The book is called Unconquered, and it's available. Uh, Scott will be here, and uh, my dear friend uh, Jeff Dabelko will host uh, this discussion. Finally, on December the 13th, I invite you all back here because we are going to have a very important discussions related to Rio. As you probably know, in 2008, uh, Rio started to deploy a new strategy to contain violence in Rio, and it called the uh, Units of Pacifying Police. It was just in the news uh, recently. Uh, there were two uh, surveys done about uh, the results so far. Uh, and we will have an event here, a discussion on that, uh, to see how is this new strategy in community policing doing. First indications are positive. Violence levels have been reduced, dramatically reduced in places famous like City of God. Uh, and uh, it continues. There will be, there have been 17 uh, areas already uh, 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 affected by this new policy, there will be 21 more until uh, Rio plus 20. So if you're interested in that subject, uh, come back here on uh, this, uh, December 13th, and uh, uh, there will be a very inter interesting discussion with two surveys, one from uh, done by Brazilians in Rio, the other done also in Rio by a uh, uh, American scholar that lived for many, many years in uh, those areas in Brazil. Uh, so it will be a very interesting discussion. With that, I would like to thank very much uh, Richenda von Lewin uh, and uh, our dear uh, Tom Lovejoy and, and Jacob Shear. Special, special thanks for Ambassador uh, uh, Luiz Alberto Figueiredo for being here, for sharing uh, the, the, all this information, the Brazilian government perspective. Uh, and uh, thank you also for Michael, to Michael and the others uh, that assisted, and to my colleague and friend Jeff Tabelco that co-hosted this with us. Thank you very much, and come back. <laughs>